cháu Ma people, ma people, are we live? Are we live? Yo, our Saris Luis Uwacho in the building. Today we have a guest. We have Prince Dynast Amir. He's here right now. He's waiting in studio. Can't wait to talk to him. We're going to talk about his book. We're going to talk about his travels. We're going to talk about his passion for Africa. Ma people, Welcome to you and I talk show live, yo. Arama people, dynasty. How are, Dynast. you? How are you? <laughs> Thank you. Oh man, Thank I'm you. doing great. You're looking great. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh man, I've been following your work oh, for so long. Here. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Keep going. I'm, I'm listening. I'm just gonna throw another book up here. Yeah, I've I've been, been following your work for so long. I'm mm -hmm. so proud of everything that you have done, and I love your passion for Africa and Every time I see you traveling, I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe he went there again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so welcome to you and I. And uh, let's start by talking about you and the books that you have right there. Right. Yes, everyone. Well, first of all, Louis, thank you so much for having me. It really means a lot, guys. Thank you, everyone who's out there watching. Thank you for, for joining us. So um, my name is Prince Dynasty of Befe Adewale Emir. Uh, I let's see what I am. I am a bridge builder. So I am building a bridge between the diaspora and Africa uh, through art, commerce, and culture. So you know that's that's my role. That's my title. That's what I do. Uh, that is what I do. So as far as the books, I have written several children's books. Um, so these are a couple right here. A couple of them right here. Kinky, kinky hair is kingly hair, and kinky hair is queenly hair. And my new release, which um, Luis has a picture of, it's over here on the other side of the table, is It's Libation Time. There you go. Bam. It's Libation Time, A Children's Guide to the Ancestors. That's the newest release. Uh, they're available at Amazon.com or if you go to DynastyMirror.com, you can grab a copy. So guys, go out there. Please support. And I really, really appreciate it. Absolutely. So what is it that made you focus on writing for children? You know what? It, it's just so my first book was actually a sales book, uh, Sales Motivation 101, uh, Get Off Your Ass and Cold Call. So in corporate America, uh, my role, my position was sales. I was always uh, I was a sales rep. So I wrote a book on sales. Then it's just the um, the inspiration just like I meditate every morning. So I get up early every morning. And I meditate and it's just the inspiration just hit me to write a children's book. So my first children's book is The Sun Loves Me. That was this is my first children's book. So it's just I just put pen to paper and the ancestors just channeled through me, you know, the story. So then after that one, I wrote, I think so I wrote The Sun Loves Me. I think Kinky Hair is Kingly Hair was after that. Then it was um Amina's Third Eye, which is around here somewhere. Then I wrote Kinky Hair is Queenly Hair. Then it's Libation Time, but Children's Guide to the Ancestors is the uh, the final the final one. So I might write some more children's books, but right now I'm working on more of a self help project as far as my next book. So I hear you. So when you were growing up, what kind of books were you reading? And is this something maybe that you lacked growing up and that you want to share now with new generation? No, no, no. I read I read a little bit of everything. I mean, I remember, you know, I read, of course, I read my children's books, but I remember back even in elementary school, I was, you know, I read Malcolm X's By Any Means Necessary. Uh, I read the autobiography of Jomo Kenyatta. Uh, I've read, I read a little bit of, um, of, of everything growing up. So 
uh, as far as the, you know, as far as the children's books, um, I think the topics I deal with, especially when it comes to children's books in regards to like, it's libation time, a children's guide to the ancestors. I don't think there's anything other, but I don't think there are too many books out. There you go. I don't think there are too many books that are in this subject matter when it comes to children in regards to the ancestors and the different deities, African deities. Specifically for children, you know, I don't think there are any other books out there, children's books out there like that. So um, I, I think definitely my children's books are, are filling a, a much needed void. Um, you know, kinky hair is killing hair, kinky hair is cooling hair is dealing with, you know, a, a lot of us growing up because of just what we're fed by by the TV and fed by media. Uh, we are told that our features are inferior and that the that white standard is the standard of beauty. So, uh, you know, these two books in The Sun Loves Me, that it deals with, um, you know, our children seeing positive images of people who have features like them and how they were able to make a positive impact on the globe, not just their society on a local level, but on the planet as a whole. So Kinky Hair is Kingly Hair, you know, Massa, who's the uh, the main character, you know, he learns throughout the book, you know, the the different um, African, you know, black African uh, leaders and heroes who have dark skin and kinky hair, just like him, who have those same features. Because, again, uh, growing up, just watching, you know, being fed, you know, this poison on TV. You know, a lot of us, we have sometimes have self-esteem issues because we're taught that, hey, we're not our dark skin, our, our kinky hair is not the standard of beauty and it's not beautiful. But, you know, the white skin and blue eyes and blonde hair, that's the standard of beauty. So, you know, it's, it's time to, to, to correct that. And, you know, I want to make sure kids are comfortable in their skin and proud of who they are. I hear you. Um, and then I was reading about how you uh, went to Africa like uh, you sort of went there accidentally, you were trying to go somewhere else and then there was no flights to that other place. And then you ended up going to uh, Tanzania and right. then uh, you discovered Zanzibar. Right. Yeah. So originally, so back in 2011, uh, I was working in corporate America. It was doing very well, making very good money. And uh, a friend of mine was like, Dinah, you should go take a vacation, go on a cruise, just go somewhere. And I say, you know what, I'm gonna go to Brazil. You know, I'm gonna go to Brazil. You know, I'm gonna get all these hot, beautiful Brazilian women and I'm gonna have fun. And so uh, I had everything set up. I was gonna go. And then the person that was gonna host me, she backed out. She backed out because she couldn't make it. I guess she has a work conflict or whatever. So then I called my other friend and I'm like, um, you know, I was gonna go to Brazil. I don't know where to go now for vacation. And he's like, go to Tanzania. Is it Tanzania? Is it Tanzania or is it Tanzania? Well, both of them. It doesn't, matter. it doesn't matter. Okay. So he was like, go to Tanzania. And I was like, okay, let me think about it. This is back in 2011. And so I started to research Tanzania and uh, the island of Zanzibar came up. And so Zanzibar is also a name of a popular nightclub that was in Los Angeles. I don't think it's there anymore. I'm sorry, Santa Monica, which is right outside of L.A. I'm not sure if it's there anymore, but it's the name of a popular nightclub. So that just gave me confirmation to go. So, you know, then I started, you know, I said, okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to Tanzania. And I went and I, I fell in love with, with, um, with Africa and I've been hooked ever since. Wow. That is such a, that, that is like, it was in your destiny. And then, wow. you know, like destiny had sort of to sort of corner you into it somehow. Uh, so then how did you go from that one uh, first um, visit to the many other visits that you went through and then to eventually becoming a prince in uh, Nigeria? I, mm -hmm. I see that uh, you have a YouTube channel, search for Uhuru, mm -hmm. you know, like um, how did you go from there to, um, you know, becoming now um, uh, uh, a prince in Nigeria. Did you discover something? Did you go through the whole DNA testing? I know that a lot of African-Americans uh, will go through DNA testing to find out where they're from, and then they go back to that specific community. Right, so uh, part was uh, my my king, my Oba, and Odoruo, Adeyemi Adeyaju, Oba, 
my Oba, Oba me. Uh, you know, it was discovered that my ancestors came from the kingdom of Odoruo. So, you know, my name, my full name, there you go, there you go, it's on the screen. Uh, Abefe Adewale are my Yoruba names. Abefe means deeply loved. Adewale means the crown returns home. So my ancestors were take when they when they were taken taken from Oruo, they were taken as royalty. So then the descendant me came back as royalty. So that's how that came about. Then also you have DNA as well, being Nigerian, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, Minde, so in 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 Yoruba from Nigeria. So um, that's how that came about. Mm. So what does it mean for you to finally uh, understand where you come from and to go there and actually connect with the people who are still living there? How was the reception and how do you feel about it? Uh, the reception was beautiful. In fact, my coronation, uh, when you go to my YouTube page, my coronation is uh, online um, on my YouTube page. So yeah, the, the, the reception was, was awesome. Um, it's just, so the 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 idea behind search for Uhuru was a uh, it's a journey of self discovery. Uh, so when I first time I went to um, Africa to Tanzania, you know when I walked out of the airport, uh, Julius Nairi Airport in um, in Dar es Salaam in Dar, you know the the locals they saw me and they immediately started speaking Swahili to me, and I just I just said I don't. I don't, I don't I don't know what you're saying. I speak English. But then they assumed I was South African. I said, no, I'm not South African. Then they assumed I was Ghanaian. And I'm like, no, I'm not Ghanaian. Then they assumed I was Nigerian, which I am. But at that time, I wasn't aware. And I'm like, no, I'm, I don't know. And they said, what are you? I said, I'm Black American. But they said, okay, but what tribe are you from? And I said, I, I, you know, I don't know. And, you know, they, 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 they didn't understand how I guess they don't. They didn't understand the when we were taken away as slaves, our prisoners of war, whatever you want to call it, how we were disconnected from everything. So for the majority of African Americans, you know, our identity is Black American or African American because we were completely disconnected from everything. And I had to explain that to them, and they still didn't get it. Like they just they didn't understand. So. In that, I say, you know what? I, I want to discover who I am and where I'm from. So I started a DNA test. Uh, I started just to travel throughout Africa to see what you know will be the uh, the best fit for me. And my home is Nigeria and Sierra Leone. That's on the continent. That's where I'm setting up shop. That's that's go that's going to be home. You know, that's where my roots are my ancestry, my roots. So that's where I'm setting up shop. Mm, that is very interesting because it reminds me how much um, Africans don't actually know about the struggle of black America. Like, um, uh, you know, when, when black Americans, African Americans were taken, stolen from Africa, life went on in Africa and Africans continue to have their own struggle. And the education system in Africa does not necessarily teach anything about the uh, the slave trade. So it's kind of a shock when they see uh, Black America right. and they learn about the things that Black America has had to go through. You know, right. like even for myself, when I came to North America and learn the things that black America had to go through, it was mm. like, whoa, you know? Because in Africa, when um, the, the people that we see, uh, the white people that we see coming to Africa, uh, they come for charity organization. You know, we don't see, in modern times, we don't see any bad white people coming to Africa. So the idea of learning that here in this society, in North America, white people you know have been so bad towards black people is a kind of a, a shock to africans you know what i mean because right. these days you get tourists going to africa you get people going for humanitarian purposes you know so it's it's like a lack of education between the two 
uh, Africa, the continent, and Africa, the diaspora, you know? How does uh, uh, Black America feel about that? Or you as a Black American, how did you feel about that? As far as the, the disconnect, as far as Africa, I mean, Africans not really knowing about the slave trade? Yeah. I was shocked. I thought, see, I thought they, since, I thought they were taught, you know, about the slave trade. But then, you know, I come to notice that, you know, they're not really educated about it. I don't, I don't have any clue about it. Even now, I would expect, you know, East Africa, because, you know, you know, the majority of the, the slaves came from West Africa. So, you know, East Africa, you know, they'll kind of get a pass. But in like West Africa, the majority of Africans, you know, they have no clue about the slave trade. Absolutely no, absolutely no clue. So I was kind of shocked by that. But then when you find out that the educational system is still British based or basically colonial based, then you understand why um, they're not taught about it. Mm. So it's like there's a deliberate um, uh, system that uh, prevents Africans from learning their history, that what happened to them in Africa, uh, you know, uh, and then there's also a deliberate um, a system in America not to teach anything positive about Africa to right. Africans in Absolutely. America. You Absolutely. Know? Like, like I said, uh, people are still using 1970s and 1980s stereotypes to justify not going to Africa in 2020. You know, I'm still getting the lions in the street, or the tigers in the street, or elephants in the streets. You know, I'm, st I'm still getting that to this day. Still getting that. So, you know, that that's part of the issue. Yeah. So when you organize trips mm -hmm. and uh, you take people to Africa and they discover Nigeria or all those other places that you've been that are so amazing, what is the reception when people see you traveling in Africa and having a great time? What's the reception? I mean, it brings people who are, are interested and curious, and especially now in 2020. When I first went in 2011, people thought I was crazy. They thought I was nuts. You know, and then gradually, of course, you know, the whole black power, you know, conscious community, you know, they understood. But the uh, I would say white collar uh, corporate, um, you know, black professionals, they were like, why you go to Africa? But now in the last couple of years, there's been a shift. A lot of black professionals are, are in, very, very interested in Africa now. So so the reception has been good. So what's the relationship, ideally, that you would want? Because I know that uh, one of your names uh, means uh, bridge. Um, right. The, um, the uh, Oluse Afara. Oh, yeah, Oluse Afara. Uh -huh. That means bridge builder. Mm -hmm. Afara. Mm -hmm. So what, would you, what, what do you want, ideally, uh, to happen between Africa and African-Americans and Africans in Africa and Africans in America? Uh, I think it's, um, as far as black Americans, we're gonna have to, you know, cause the argument is who should reach out to who first. So, you know, African Americans are like, well, you know, they sold us and they're the governments aren't doing a good enough job, you know, as far as extending that helping hand or reaching out you know, the on the continent, they're like, well, look, we were in slavery too through, through colonialism for the most part. And in these borders that we have now didn't exist, uh, you know, when, you know, you guys were, were, were taken or sold or whatever you want to call it. So right now it's the who's going to, you know, it's like a, a man and a woman. You know, the woman is like, I want the man to, you know, engage and approach me. I'm not going to approach uh, approach him, you know what I mean? So it's like, that's kind of where we're at now. But I think uh, black Americans, because of what's going on in America, um, we can't afford to be stubborn. Like we have to, you know, start building that bridge and engaging Africa. Like we have to, like we have no choice, mm. you know? I, I, I sometimes think that, um, Africa, as uh, a mother who mm -hmm. lost her children, would also want to take on that responsibility of going to search for her children right. and to uh, try to bring them back home. 
or to do everything that they can. I often think that the uh, African Americans, uh, the diaspora is sort of uh, the international community that right. Africa needs because you always hear about this international community uh, that intervenes in African issues. But I think the uh, African Americans would be sort of the perfect international community. And also, as um, African Americans, as a voice, as citizens of the United States, one of the most powerful countries on the planet, I think if you used your voice in your politics so that the United States would have a better foreign policy towards Africa, so then we would have a peace in some of the countries that the United States is responsible for installing dictatorships, for example, if Black America campaigned to have better politics towards Africa, then we could have a peaceful Africa and African Americans could come back to Africa to peaceful and solid countries that are not getting sabotaged by the United States where you live and pay taxes. So I don't know how you see the involvement of Black America into American politics and going beyond the Democrats and Republicans and looking at the foreign policy as well, especially towards Africa. Well, you gotta understand black Americans. So this is the majority of black Americans are disconnected from Africa. So that's number one. And number two, with that being said, the majority of black Americans see themselves as Democrat first, Christian second, and then black third. So, trying to convince black Americans as a whole to have this Africa engage or Africa plan. It, it, it's just, it's, it's a pipe dream, unfortunately, no, no matter what. Uh, so it's going to just be a select few who are going to build that bridge and, uh, you know, form those relationships. Because again, it's whatever direction the democratic party moves, the black people are going to give their vote and follow and not ask yeah. anything in return. So that that's kind of where we're at with that. So I think expecting, having those expectations uh, uh, for from the black community in regard as a whole, in regards to engaging Africa, it, it's not gonna happen. I mean, mm. I, I wanna be positive, but it's just, it's not gonna be happening. It's not gonna happen. And yeah, we, the whole, you know, Africans don't like us and all this other stuff. And, you know, why should we engage with them when they're all trying to come over here, you know, so they don't, they, it's just being black in America, we're, we're taught that anything, if you leave America, you're not going to survive, that America is the uh, end all be all. So as far as thinking more on a global uh, scale, when it comes to politics and engaging Africa, the average black American doesn't even see out of his immediate neighborhood. Mm. So, I see, but isn't that kind of ironic or uh, like I don't understand why uh, black America, African Americans would be so attached to the Democratic Party when uh, back in the days it used to be the party of slavery. And actually, if you did not support slavery, if you wanted freedom, you had to leave the Democrats and join the Republicans. So w w this attachment to the Democrats doesn't make any sense and and what have the democrats done for black people that is so beautiful and amazing that they would uh, deserve this particular attachment that black people have for them so at, at, in the 60s uh, martin luther king and, and people who are watching this if my history is off uh, i apologize ahead of time but i'm kind of i'm, I'm going to be kind of in the ballpark martin luther king jr and I'm I'm uh, I'm gonna say a cuss word. Can I can I? It's, I'm, I'm just I'm just repeating what the president said. So, you know, I just I don't know if this is PG TV uh, PG TV or or not. But Martin Luther King met with Lyndon B. Johnson, who was a staunch racist white supremacist, uh, in regards to the Civil Rights Act. Lyndon B. Johnson said that with this, basically, he's gonna have those niggas voting Democrat for the next hundred years. And it's came, it, 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 and it's, came, it's come true. So the Democratic Party doesn't have to do anything for black people. Black people are just gonna give them their vote. That's just, wow. like I said, Democrat first, Christian second, black third. 
So do, do we need like um, a ceremony, a traditional African ceremony to liberate and release uh, Black America from this? Uh, uh, they, they, they reject it. They, they reject it. <laughs> because, you know, if you see, I think that Black America doesn't actually realize its power. Because, for example, when you see how black, much black, money... Black, black America doesn't want power. What do, what do they want? What, what, what? We're, 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 we're comfortable. As long as we have access to, you know, decent paying jobs and credit cards in the American dream, yeah, we're fine. Like we're saying, okay. anything outside of that, you know, it, it just that doesn't exist. Like that's the end game. Mm. You know. But I, I also often wonder, like, if you have been kidnapped from your home and enslaved in another land, um, and then eventually you become free, shouldn't you be seeking to go back to your home where you were kidnapped and discovering that and taking your inheritance from that instead of fighting to have a piece of America, which is uh, not necessarily... Um, you know, favorable to you. Uh, again, the majority of Black Americans see themselves as Democrat first. Here we go. Uh, here we go. Democrat first, Christian second, American third, African fourth. So okay. again, they see themselves as Democrat American. So it's uh, not going to happen. So I, I sh then w what if we even go further and question this idea of being Christian? Because religion, whether it be Christianity or Islam, is part of the tools that were used to enslave Africans. Whether it's African Americans, even in Africa, people are enslaved through religion, through Christianity and Islam. So the idea of identifying as Christians and, and Muslim and having that as uh, blocking you from seeing your ancestors, your African wealth, how does that make people free? You have to, okay, so you got to understand. The, our ancestors had their own specific spiritual systems that they crafted through the, the, through the higher spirits or beings, whatever you want to call it. Their own system. The way a lot of, and not just black Americans, this is all over Africa too now as far as Christianity and Islam, but I speak on behalf of black Americans, we are still having arguments and debates about the race of a guy named Jesus who no one could prove ever existed. So that's how it's rationalized. Like, look, Jesus was a black man. Okay, Jesus never existed, prove it. Where's the, where's the museum at? Take me, I mean, you could go right now to Egypt. You'll see the pharaohs, you'll see everything from when Jesus allegedly existed in Egypt. You'll see tombs. In fact, I think a couple of days ago, they just unearthed it, another Egyptian mummy that's been there for thousands of years. But your Jesus, your Moses, your where, 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 where's the museum? Where's anything? So I think how a lot of black Americans rationalize this whole religion thing is, well, they were all black and but it's like okay but they never existed or, or prove it you know so it's like what we want to do we want to take milk from a cow a white cow put chocolate powder in it mix it it's now chocolate milk but the foundation is still the milk from the cow the cow doesn't give chocolate milk. You never go to a cow and the cow or goats, and you'll never get chocolate milk. It's gonna be white milk. No matter how much chocolate powder you put into it, the foundation is still white. So the Bible, the Islam, no matter how much you try to Africanize it, it's still white, and then you're still dealing with you're dealing with allegories of people that never existed. And so a lot of us think that if we try to Africanize it and put the chocolate powder in the Bible, that all of a sudden now her is African. No, it's still King James. It's still King James. It's still Council of Nicaea. You know, it's, yeah. Nah, I see. I see what you're saying. So, which is why your work, a search for Uhuru, which Uhuru means uh, freedom, mm -hmm. 
um, it, it's so important because it's like you are searching for freedom and there are all these people who are on the search for freedom, uh, then how do you find freedom? What is freedom to you? What does freedom look like? And what will freedom look like for you in a few years for black America? Uh, freedom, well, huh. <laughs> for those who, I guess, who truly want freedom is going to be taking your resources out of, out of America and shifting them to Africa. That's the only freedom. Anything else, anything outside of that is just you're you're on the hamster wheel. Mm. Now I saw that you um, got the Nigerian citizenship. Correct. How how's the process? Um, is that something that you know? What is the advantage of having the Nigerian citizenship? And you know what exactly does that allow you to do that the American citizenship wouldn't allow you to do by itself? Well, I have. I mean, I'm Nigerian, so I have a home now in Nigeria. Like I'm officially Nigerian. You know, uh, I'm. Uh, so I mean, it, it's just I, like I said, you have to think outside of America. You know, America is not the end all be all. Africa is the future. Nigeria is the giant of Africa. Um, so it's just, when you look at it, like it, I have, I'm a dual citizen now. I have, a, I have an official home in Africa. Like I, I officially, you know, it, it comes to a point, you know, me going back and forth, you know, all of the, the, the spiritual and the welcoming ceremonies and, you know, you show up to the airport or you show up to, a local village and they welcome you in. That's great and it's appreciated and it's beautiful. But now I am officially, officially documented on paper an African. You know, I think which is, you know, important. You know, the, the symbology is great, but the tan, when you have those tangibles as well, it's even better. And then, but the you know the, the the main issue I have, especially with West Africa in general versus East Africa, East Africa. If you have a U.S. passport, you can pretty much travel throughout East Africa either visa free or visa on arrival. West Africa, just about every country, you have to get a visa before, and not even visa on arrival, visa before you go. Um, so you have what is called ECOWAS, which is the Eastern. Ah, I forgot the, but it's ECOWAS. Yeah which is a number of West African countries uh, where if you have a passport from that country, you could travel throughout those Echoes countries visa free. And there are some other perks as well. Uh, hopefully the, I know they're working on the African union passport, which will pretty much open up all borders, uh, you know, in Africa, which is, I think is very important because, you know, these borders we have, we're, you know, we didn't have a seat at the uh, Berlin conference. When those when these borders were drawn were drawn up, so hopefully this African pa African Union passport uh, is kicked in pretty soon, uh, and I think also too they're going to have one central Echoist passport as well. Before then, I'm not sure yet, but I think I heard that. So instead of just you having it a Nigerian or Togolese or Gambian or Senegalese or Ghanaian or uh, Benin or Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, passport, you'll just have one central Echoist passport, I think. So, you know, those are some of the perks, but just having that passport, you know, again, search for who, search for freedom. You know, where are you from? Who are you? You know, I'm Nigerian, soon to be Sierra Leonean. That's where I'm from. That's my DNA. That's where I'm born. Well, not physically born, but by birth. You know, DNA is passed down through birth. I'm Nigerian. I'm Sierra Leonean. Therefore, you know, my roots, my ancestors come from Oruo. My ancestors are Mende in Sierra Leone. So therefore, officially welcome me. Mm. Um, your, 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 your stolen, lost son is now back. And not just back just to, to hang out, back to to actually 
build, develop, contribute, make an impact on society, make an impact not just on uh, Nigeria and Sierra Leone, but uh, African society as a whole. So, so welcome me, officially. Uh Absolutely. Um, it's it's such a beautiful thing because that it, it feels like a full circle type of thing, you know, right, like if you yeah, yeah, it's a full circle. Yeah. But like I said, my, my ancestors were taken away from Odoruo as royalty and now I've came back. The descendant has came back, returned. I didn't realize he's returned. Yeah. You know, one thing that I want to say about uh, uh, Black America is that the resistance that they have been through oh, for generations and the, the strength with which they have uh, survived and resisted oppression and enslavement is a testimony to the power that inhabits your bloodline. You know what I mean? Because the fact that they were taken from Africa, they were not slaves in Africa, they were enslaved in America. And that, that, word, that difference is huge. So they have actually been able to prove that they were not slaves because if they were slaves, they would never aspire to freedom. But it's precisely because they were not slaves and because they knew who they were and they knew their worth that no matter how much they tried to enslave them, they fought and resisted against slavery. And today you are alive and you are making the journey back home. You know, I think it's a beautiful story. Thank you. So now this, uh, it's liberation time, mm -hmm. uh, a children's guide to the ancestors. Yes. When you go into Africa and you go into African spirituality, a lot of people are reluctant because they're like, ooh, black magic. And who, who, told, who told them that? Yeah. <laughs> who told them that and then who gave you your Bible? Mm. No coincidence. Mm. So this do you do you feel this resistance when you try to tell parents about African spirituality and the ancestors and they are still within that identity and they are like, oh no, you're trying to take our children into dark things and devil things and pagan things. Like how do they receive these things? <laughs> I mean, if you're open to it, you're open to it. But at the same time, if you read the Bible in the Quran, I mean, it's filled with paganism as well. So, you know, it's why is this paganism okay, but your own African paganism is evil? You know, if you read the, the, the Bible and the Quran, they have black magic in it as well. But why is this black magic God's will, but this black magic, this African black magic, is evil. Everything that's in uh, African spirituality that's deemed evil is also in the Bible. Is also in the Quran. I mean, what was it? Jesus turned water into wine. <laughs> That'd be considered, considered black magic. <laughs> Jesus turned water into wine. Uh, I mean, what, what else do we have here? Um, God took Adam's rib and made Eve. Am I correct? Is that not black magic? Is that not black magic? Yeah. God made man from earth from dirt. Is that not black magic? Let's see here. God rained thunder and, and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah? <laughs> Is that not black magic? And then when I think it was Lot, or I forgot who it was, who they were running, they said, don't turn around, or are you going to turn into stone? Somebody turned it around and turned into stone. Is that not black magic? <laughs> so why is, is the, the this black magic bad, but the black magic from your ancestors evil? Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Did, that Jesus, is, did Jesus die and rise, allegedly die and rise in three days? Is that not black magic? <laughs> wow. So um, 
when's the next time that you're going and how has the current uh restrictions for traveling and all that stuff affected you and your work and your connection to africa and how do you see this interfering with the future how people are going to want to travel you know uh so i had tours planned march of this year march august november and december obviously uh that got canceled because of covid so next year well but me personally i'm going back in november so in november i'll be going to i'm gonna try to go to senegal but right now it's going to be sierra leone cote d'ivoire and nigeria um in in uh, november the next year as far as tours we're gonna be back doing sierra leone um sierra leone in Nigeria. So right now, tentatively, it's Sierra Leone in April, Nigeria in August and November, then back to Sierra Leone in December for tours. Um, so that's that's what we got going on. Mm, I see. So well, coming back to America right now, people are going to be voting. I've seen you campaign saying that you're not going to be voting. No, I'm not going to vote. All right. Um, so who should people give their vote to right now? <laughs> uh, people should vote with their conscience. That makes the most sense. Uh, I just, when you hear black Republicans in regards to why they're voting for Trump versus black Democrats and why they're voting for Biden, uh, the black Democrat is usually very emotional. And then the black Republican I mean, he, he'll make, he makes more sense, you know, so, but at the end of the day, you vote your conscience, vote who for who you want to, uh, me, I will not be participating in the election. Only way I will participate in the election is if I drive by the poll and the line is I can go in and out, then I might hop out the car and go vote, uh, independent. But outside of that, I, I got more important stuff to do. Yeah. How do you feel when uh, Biden, who's been the vice president to Obama all these years, Obama is one of those guys who bombed uh, Africa Libya. and brought slavery back to Africa. Right. And Biden was right next to him. And then uh, the vice president that Biden picked is a woman who was involved with policies that uh, imprisoned uh, black America. So, like the combination, I don't really see uh, any uh, anything positive for Black America on that side. How did you feel when the whole thing unfolded? Well, uh, again, we're, we're, we're Democrat first, Christian or American Christian than Black. So it doesn't matter who the Democrats put out; Black people are just going to vote for. Them. You know, that's just how they operate. And not only vote for them, but also excuse their past history, you know, just because that's just how it operates. So, okay, so then, you know, black people are like, what, political, political slaves? Like, yeah, political. yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Because usually the whole point of voting for someone politically is that that person represents you and represent your interest and is going to do something. I would take it, for example, the Jewish community in America, uh, they get a lot of money sent to Israel from America. And that is why they would support some politicians because these politicians will support Israel. Mm -hmm. You know, like black America with their power. We, is, no, we don't want power. We don't want power. We don't want power. We just want to just be comfortable. We're creatures of comfort. Okay, so then, then the whole Uhuru, the Uhuru thing is going to get to America, like, there's a, a, how many more generations until the Uhuru thing, like, I don't understand, you know how they say that they brought black people to build America, so that means that other people recognized your power, other people recognize African magic, African power and the capacity of Africans to accomplish all these things, but Africans themselves don't recognize that? Again, we are just content with being comfortable. We're, 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 we're comfortable right now. So 
Yeah, they don't recognize it. They just we just want to be comfortable. Like everybody, many of us are content in our current present situation or circumstances. So, mm. when you go back to Nigeria and then you get into African politics or Nigerian politics, and then you also get into tribal or politics, mm -hmm. how do you handle that? You know, uh, especially when you are identified to a great tribe such as the Yorubas, but the Yorubas are like uh, in competition always with the Igbo, for example, right? So how do you handle that, that ongoing brotherly friendly competition that they have going on between the Yorubas and the Igbo and the whole tribal scene in Nigeria? Well, I'm Nigerian first. Uh, I, I, I don't get involved in the tribal division. I'm all about unity. Uh, that's how we have to move forward. So I'm, I'm Nigerian first. And again, the, um, you know, the, the, the tribal division, I don't, I don't support it. Mm. So I don't, I don't get involved in the, if it's not unifying, I don't get involved in the, the tribal, uh, politics. Mm -hmm. So in Nigeria, there's a lot of young people who see America and they want to come to America right. and they, that's their dream. When they see you saying, going the other way, you're American, like there's a lot of young Africans, they wish they were black Americans because of how black America is represented. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and they wish they would come to America also and have that comfort then you're doing the exact opposite going into Africa. How do, do young people see you and what do they tell you? Uh, they, they actually encourage me. Like I'm, I get a lot of, you know, Africans, they encourage me what I'm doing. They say, thank you, Dinah, for, for doing the work that you do. Um, you know, I, I have no problem with Africa. So Booker T. Washington, uh, I forgot the name of the policy he had. Uh, the great Booker T. Wallace, uh, Booker T. It's, it, it, I forgot the name of the the plan or policy he had, Booker T. Washington. But back when he opened Tuskegee uh, University in Alabama, he encouraged African students to come and learn how to be become self sufficient under the. Uh, but they would have to return and go back. And the skills that they learned at Tuskegee in Alabama and America, they would have to take those skills, develop those skills, and then take them back to Africa and build in Africa. See, the problem we're having now is many are coming and be learning these skills, but they're not going back. And that's the issue. So when we look at China, Chinese came to America, learned, and then they went back. But, you know, I, but I think my generation and then I think the generation after me you know, we're, we're going back to go, to go build. And like I said, there are a lot of, you know, people in corporate America now who are reaching out to me saying, Hey, Dennis, look, I've, you know, I've done all I can do in corporate America. I'm not advancing, you know, I'm not getting promoted. You know, I want to take my talents to Africa. So it's, it's a shift happening. Absolutely. Um, so we're coming towards the end of the show. Uh, in terms of, um, African policy and African politics, what is it that you would like to request from Africans as individuals, as people, and also Africans as different governments to the best way in which they can help you build that bridge, you know, the best way that they can connect to Africans in Africa, in America? Uh, I would say, you know, Every every African country has a embassy or consulate in uh, in America. Everyone in D.C. in New York. Let's let's start having this conversation on a government level. I mean, let's the 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 consulates, the you know the uh, what's the word I want to use, the ambassadors, uh, or here in the U.S. You know, let's open up these uh, embassies and consulates. Have a you know African American and you know, Nigerian or Ghanaian, you know, God is doing a pretty good job, but, you know, Senegalese, you know, let's start having these conversations so we can start putting everything on the table. You know, when the president comes, you know, every African head of state, they come to America, obviously, you know, let's, let's have these open forums. Let's not close them off the close or, you know, 
tape them off and just include just the typical, you know, black politicians here in America who aren't really speaking on behalf of the black collective. So, you know, let's start having this dialogue, um, this official dialogue. And I mean, like I said, the embassies are right there in DC, they're in New York. So let's let's start having this dialogue. I mean, that's the start. I think that's what needs to happen. Because mm -hmm. right now it's very informal. It's like one off here, one off there. But let's start having this this collective uh, dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, I've also seen that you are learning an African language. Yoruba. Yes. Mokawa Yoruba. Mokawa Yoruba. I'm studying Yoruba. It's been uh -huh. on and off, but I have to. Like that, I have. I have to. So. What is it doing for you to study Yoruba? And w what are you discovering through studying Yoruba? What are you discovering? Uh, that I just, I need to learn. I mean, I can't be going, I can't go back and forth to the continent, consider myself Yoruba and not fully know the language. Like I have to learn the language, <laughs> you know, like I have to. So. Yeah. Is there things that you're seeing in the language that that jump onto you or that explain, you know, because African uh, languages are multidimensional and, you know, it's not as simple as the English language. Um, is there like, is there a cultural shift that you're having to do in order to be able to learn the language? Like how smooth is the process going? Uh yeah, I mean I, I it's, it's 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 not uh it's not easy, you know. Um you, so I think one thing is sometimes there's been and I think this is far especially when it comes to uh religion. So in the um, in the majority of African languages, like all African languages, I, I could be wrong, I'm not a linguist. There's no concept of the devil. But through mistranslation and, you know, missionaries having uh, ulterior motives, they'll say, OK, this is the devil. In your or this is evil. You know, when really there's like disagreeable and agreeable, they say that's the evil, that's the devil. When really there is no concept of the devil. So, you know, you have little things like that. But, you know, I'm still learning. Uh, you know, I'm still learning. Absolutely. So what would you like um, to say to people? Um, um, and, you know, what would you like to say to people who are following you? What's your main message? I see people who give messages. You, you give messages every day. It's a comment from the Internet. I discovered Dynasty years ago and took a trip to Tanzania. And enjoy his YouTube channel. <laughs> Uh, so what's the message that you want to give out to people? Uh, it, it's simple. Uh, Africa is the future. You know, Africa is the future. And for the uh, and, and Africa will give you an opportunity to, you know, here in America, you know, the 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 common, I would say, topic or issue is black people being locked out of uh, wealth. Um you know, with the prices of real estate going up, black people not being able to uh, acquire real estate, acquire ownership, acquire land, which is wealth. You get a, a fresh start on life or a new lease on life in Africa because right now everything's affordable. So if you're trying to build generational wealth, if you're trying to build or acquire assets as far as land, I mean, you know, and, and you're seeing yourself that you can't do it here in America. Uh, Africa is a is, is is a great option. Africa is the future. That is such a powerful statement. Um, I will. Um, we're coming to the end. Uh, one thing that it makes me think about. Uh, you know this whole idea in the Bible. Since we were talking about the Bible and Christians of uh, Jews being enslaved in Egypt and then after hundreds of years coming out of Egypt with uh, a lot of wealth. Um, since that has been proven to be Bible fiction because there was no slavery in Africa, there was no slavery in Egypt and there was no, no one separating the ocean in order to take people out of uh, Egypt into a new uh, land. 
And uh, some people have actually said that the story of a people being enslaved in a foreign land for generations is the story of black America, which was stolen and enslaved in America. And after a few generations will come out of America with great wealth and go back to Africa with so much wealth to rebuild their own home, to rebuild their own continent. What do you think about that story? Uh, yeah, yeah, but you know, I just, well, number, well, I would say this, I, I'm not a Hebrew, I'm not an Israelite, I'm African, I am Yoruba, I'm Mende, I'm not a Hebrew Israelite. So, you know, it's just, you know, you have certain uh, communities here in America who they want to be everything but African. They want to be Native Americans, they want to be Omex, you know, they want to be Hebrew Israelites, they want to be everything but Africa. You know, we identified ourselves as Igbo, Hassa, Fulani, Minde, Wolof, Yoruba, uh, you know, Fon. We never identified ourselves as Hebrew Israelites. So, you know, it's a great story, but again, you know, and, 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 and it, it, it can give inspiration. But at the end of the day, we are African, we're Fon, we are uh, Yoruba, Wolof, Tiv, Maasai. I mean, we, the, the list goes on. You know, we're not Hebrew Israelites. So, yeah. I, uh. So people should stop, you know, they should stop the, the, that story and embrace their identity like you have. Yeah, I mean, they, they can do what they want, but, you know, just on a, and I'm not, I'm not claiming to be a scholar or this, this intellectual, but just, again, I've been up and down West Coast Africa, you know, and no one calls himself a Hebrew Israelite. They're, again, a Shanti or, you know, so, like I said, just, we have an issue in, in, in America. Everybody wants to be everything but African. They want to attach themselves to all other identities. You know, Asiatic black man and all. Oh, no. I hear you. Well, Prince Dynast, Amir, thank you so much. It's been uh, such a pleasure talking to you. I love your work. Uh, shout out to uh, Oruruo in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. I love the, the, the Oluse Afara uh, name and title that you have. Uh, because you are living up to your name. I love the Abefe at the Wale. I just <laughs> love it all. And uh, where can people contact you if they want to um, get these books, get all the products that you have, and then follow you, um, you know, into your next trips to Africa, you know, come with you to the trips that you organize? Uh, go to dynastamir.com. Go to dynastamir.com. Everything streamlined. Go there and send me a message or, you know, do whatever. Absolutely. All right, man. I appreciate it so much. Like, once again, people, that's the book. Go get this book. Uh, it's libation time. Uh, get the children learning their own history, their own great things. And uh, thank you so much. Keep, you know, keep up the great work for for africa you know i just love it and if you have any last words you want to say you go ahead otherwise it's been a beautiful uh, time talking to you I mean, everyone thank you for joining i appreciate it thank you for uh allowing me to come on all right all right all right all right thank you so much all right my people so this is the end we're coming to the end of this I think I'm going to slowly uh, continue the show. Uh, I'm going to do an after show in Kenya, Rwanda. Uh, if you uh, want to stick around and ask a few questions, uh, I'm going to do a, a, a few minutes, a few comments in Kenya, Rwanda. Stick around for two seconds, just a short break to end the English part. <laughs> Arama people, so the show ended. Uh, the show ended in um, 
in um, in English. So I am now in Kenya, Rwanda. If anybody has questions in Kenya, Rwanda, I'd be happy to take those uh, questions in Kenya, Rwanda. Uh, otherwise, if there's no questions in Kenya, Rwanda, I'm gonna end the show and keep on going. I just don't wanna feel like I've uh, neglected my Kenya, Rwanda audience today. <laughs> <laughs> I have not neglected my Kenya Rwanda audience. Uh, so I'm listening. If you have questions in Kenya Rwanda, my people, I'd be happy to answer. Mutinya Rwanda. Um, um ni umushitsi ni turangiza gukora interview no mushitsi ndi bugume muri studio gatoya nkaganira n'abashaka ko tuganira mu rurimi rwacu you know <laughs> so ubwo niba bahari turi kumwe turi kumwe Ezra ndakubona ndakubona you and i thanks mukomere cyane mukomere uh kasore ya kazikeza 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 <laughs> all right my people man okay so have a great evening everyone i don't see that many questions everybody thanks for watching subscribe to you and i talk show we are together yeah <laughs>